If you've been away from Night City for a while, or maybe you're just starting your first playthrough with Cyberpunk now, you might not know that V has some new digs to choose from other than the standard mega block you start out with. Each one of them tell a story about Night City and about the V that you want to be in this universe. Maybe you're an edge runner wanting to live literally out on the edge and out of sight. Or maybe you feel like you want to be more connected with culture and want to be in the middle of things. Or perhaps you're a corpo who wants to feel connected with their former life. Or maybe you just want to feel like you've made it and live large on the top. Whichever you choose though, I'm going to help you decide in this episode of an Architect Reviews where I will, as always, employ my professional experience to examine something in the digital realm. This time, it's the sweet new crash pads you can choose after tough gigs in Cyberpunk's Night City. One thing you might consider examining yourself though is the sponsor of today's video, NordVPN, who helped me keep the lights on when Corpo Gonks unfairly demonetize my videos. You know who you are. They now not only help you hide your IP from prying eyes, but go a step further with their new threat protection service. It works against intrusive ads, malware, trackers, and malicious websites. I've already personally used them for years after getting fed up with dealing with free VPNs that just didn't work for me. So now I can access IP restricted websites while I work from abroad and all while protecting my personal information. I also use the app on my iPad to help me watch shows like Strange New Worlds, which is frustratingly unavailable here in Taiwan. So if you're looking for a reliable VPN service and you also want to help support me and my channel, you can head on over to nordvpn.com slash morphologist to get a huge discount on a two-year plan, plus get four additional months for free. That's nordvpn.com slash morphologist. Oh, and if none of this really works for you, you can always get your money back with their 30-day money-back guarantee. So one of the things I did in preparation for this video was to do some research into how CDPR prepared for designing such an immense project. An entire city is a lot to take on, and to make it feel real and lived in takes a lot of skill and experience. What I discovered in my research was that they employed something that they called a design bible, which contains a library of each style you'll see in cyberpunk, each of which is tied to the world of cyberpunk, having a backstory for its origin and an underlying meaning. The four major design archetypes they developed were kitsch, described as style over substance, it's plastic, cheap, flamboyant, has bright neons, and the style is something that you might see edge runners or gang members wear in Night City. Entropism, which is necessity over style, this is cheap uniform utilitarian design, rugged, employing dull earth tone colors, and it's something that you'd usually find on the outer edges of Night City where people have less money and they just need something to live. Then you have neo-militarism, which is substance over style. This is the style of the corporate world. It's expensive, rigid, oppressive, organized, and usually employs strong blacks with red accents. Then you have neo-kitsch, which is style is substance. This is the style of the most elite of Night City, the high-end interpretation of the lower classes kitsch. It's kind of a parody, if you will, because the people who wear it aren't actually edge runners. they're just trying to look like they are. It's very flamboyant with bright colors and usually has lots of gold and expensive exotic materials. And so throughout this video, I'll be referring to these design styles to help inform what each space is trying to say, the underlying meaning, as it were, of these spaces, as these styles tie to the world of cyberpunk's social structure. So now let's actually begin to explore the apartments of Night City, beginning at the lowest end and ending at the top, which means we'll start at Northside Watson, at the motel turned apartment complex which can be yours for just 5,000 eddies. From the outside, it appears to be a bit of a downgrade from where you began at the Mega Block. However, as you'll find, appearances can be deceiving. The Northside Watson Motel is just down the street and an eye shot of the ritzy Compeki Plaza, a place that you'll find in the campaign featured prominently near the beginning of the story. It contrasts with Watson's downtrodden entropism design style, this is, after all, one of the poorest districts in Night City. 
Past a few chrome junkies and up a flight of stairs brings you to a Netrunner's hideout, complete with high-tech equipment to give the user an edge over corpo overlords. Being a former motel, the floor plan is typical of what you might find in an American motel, save for the addition made by the former occupant where the wall adjacent to the unit's bathroom has been knocked out and repurposed as a gun room. The space is small but cozy, big enough to serve its purpose with a place to sleep, net run, store iron, and of course use the bathroom. Now, the bathroom isn't really much to look at, but it is what it is and you get what you pay for. The room's design is a very aged kitsch style, hailing from a more optimistic time long past, evident from the curved and smooth lines of the kitchenette and storage area. One interesting note though is that the back wall is actually a large vending machine. This space then, more than any that we'll see on our tour, demonstrates an intrusion of hyper-capitalism into personal space, where even your cabinetry is pay-per-use. Think of microtransactions, but for everything in your house. While the design is just a repurposed motel room, its utilitarian nature and retrofit edge runner gear tell a compelling story about the inhabitant. It has character, it feels like a place to hide out in from corpos who just want to rob you of your freedom. And for that, despite its lack of high-end design, I love this space. Because it's clear that the designers spent some time trying to make it feel like it belongs in this world. And for that reason, big thumbs up. The next apartment on our list is located in Japantown, Westbrook, and it can be purchased for 15,000 eddies in game. And as the name of the district would suggest, this district is heavily influenced by Japanese culture, and so you'll find a good deal of very overt references to Japanese architecture scattered throughout the district. And if this district looks familiar to you and you've not played the game, it might be because it was also featured prominently in the recently released critically acclaimed Edge Runners anime on Netflix. In fact, approaching from the river, going towards the apartment that we're about to check out, you'll find that it's right next to Lucy's apartment in the old Turbo Hangout from the anime. The Japantown apartment building, like most in this district, is heavily influenced by places like Hong Kong or even some of Taiwan's older districts. Many of them seem to employ a modern design, which is modern with an E at the end. This is a far less ornate offshoot of the more popularly known Art Deco style which happened in the 1920s to 30s. This suggests that the building is quite a bit older, which is also supported by the secondary retrofitted structure that surrounds it and that supports the higher end corpo units far above, giving the sense that the building has just been built over and nearly covered completely. Even the street adjacent to it has been built over. Entering the lobby, the lower income nature of this complex becomes even more evident with its dilapidated state of repair. It feels gritty, lived in, and firmly part of the cyberpunk world. You really get the sense that you're at the lowest rung of the inner city society. Traveling up a shabby lift to our floor, we find through a beaten up old metal door a comfortably sized escape from the noise of the inner city. Just across from the entry is a shrine, along with some other heavily eastern influenced designs like a paper lantern and a bonsai tree. The seating area is modest, but comfortably sized. Above the couch is yet another reminder of hypercapitalism with an advertisement screen floating just above occupants' heads. Adjacent you'll find a nice work area flanked by windows that overlooks the river area and the rocket launch pads in the distance. So while the apartment is lower on the totem pole, the view is actually pretty spectacular and is one of my favorites. There's also a small kitchenette in the back and a utilitarian bathroom that's a bit better than what we saw last. The color palette of the space is also a bit warmer with some muted colors, which are not quite entropism but also not quite kitsch. Something maybe then in between. It reminds me of neo-futurism designs that you might have found in a capsule building in Tokyo in the 1980s. The bedroom is also a modest size, with a cubby capsule style design for its bed area that gives the subtle suggestion that the space is an industrial design and is kind of like something that's been dropped in. In fact, it kind of gives you the sense that architecture in the world of cyberpunk has been industrialized and put into a factory line, where even bedrooms are prefabricated in a factory. 
Despite this though, I find the space really cozy. One interesting choice in this floor plan though is that the gun room is actually located adjacent to the bedroom instead of the bathroom. I think if I were to change something, I might have switched the bathroom with the gun room so that there was some better programmatic adjacency. But really it's just a nitpick and I really like this apartment. So let's move on now to the Haywood Glen apartment for a whopping 40,000 eddies. This is a bit of a step up. What I find interesting is that it has a lot of subtle details that hint at the state of the world and its inhabitants. The apartment is within what appears to be an older structure that's been retrofit with structural supports, likely perhaps to help resist earthquakes and or to allow for the building to be extended in height. In case you're wondering how I make this differentiation, to an architect's or even engineer's eyes, it's rather obvious that this is a retrofit, as it not only clashes with what appears to be an earlier design, but importantly, structure is very seldomly exposed in this fashion because it's important to avoid using expensive finishes to protect the metal from corrosion and fire, which can severely weaken its load bearing capacity. It's a subtle attention detail to make the place and world feel older and in a state of decay, requiring such haphazard economical reinforcements in a place where aesthetics for the lower class are a distant, impossible luxury. Stepping on into the interior, what we find is what I would interpret as in an industrial design, but it probably falls under a cross between CD Projekt Red's entropism style and the more contemporary 2077 kitsch style. This style is something that dominates most of Night City and what you might read is kind of cyberpunk, a style distinguished by vibrant and sometimes flamboyant colors going back to the primer I gave you guys in the beginning of the video. However, the space is a bit maybe upscale from the standard kitsch style. It's definitely a bit more contemporary to the older kitsch style that started around the 2000s, which you might be more familiar with throughout the entire city. The elevator reinforces the reading of its industrial style as well with its clearly industrial gate style door and interior. And this leads us directly to the apartment, which is in stark contrast with the very low income surroundings of this building. The apartment continues in a similar design then to the lobby, but introduces even more high end finishes, namely woods, which are rare and expensive in this dystopian future, and other high end trims like gold. What this building may represent then is what we see in our real world now in modern cities where younger, wealthier generations are returning to cities and seek higher living standards in a decaying American inner city. The result is often gentrification where developers renovate previously abandoned or lower income spaces or homes into high end apartments or condos which can appeal to their new wealthier clientele which in turn drives up the rental prices of the area, displacing locals who comprise the working class of the city. This can have an effect of eroding the local sense of community and destroying local culture, and it further burdens the working class who now must travel greater distances to work or face homelessness. This, I imagine, is a rather fitting way to interpret it as we are in a hyper-capitalized cyberpunk society in this cyberpunk world. And so my mind then turns to the scene just outside the building where you'll find a bunch of homeless people living just next to the building. I don't think that this was an accident on the designer's parts. They really want to show a contrast between the building that you're living in and the appalling standard of living of those less fortunate who may have lived in the same building you are now just a few years earlier. It may just be fiction in the end, but it's great world building by CDPR here. Returning to the design then, as is typical with retrofitted industrial spaces where they were originally designed to house large machinery, the room is near double height. This allows for designers to split the space horizontally with a new second construction structure where they've logically organized the majority of the public and leisure spaces down below, leaving the new loft for a master bath and bedroom. The double height space also allows for some generously tall floor to ceiling windows, which leads to the space benefiting from a much deeper natural light penetration, even without direct sunlight. It makes the space feel a bit more comfortable. I also really like the subtle use of floor height change and material change to visually subsect the space into smaller, more comfortable social spaces. For example, the couch is recessed and uses a warm wood and stone finish which contrasts with the darker black wood finishes found near the pool table and bar and kitchenette combo. 
This is actually a strategy we use in the real world to help break down large spaces to make them feel more comfortable to users. In the opposite corner from the kitchenette area, you find one of my favorite moments in this design though. It's a combination home office and reading nook on an elevated interstitial platform. It really looks cozy and has a nice view out the window onto the city thanks to its height. I personally would love to sit here and read or just relax and listen to music. In the corner just next to the entrance is also the stash room. This is a space you'll see common to all of these apartments as it's a requirement for the edge runner trade. Like the rest, it's all business in here with racks to display the various special weapons you can collect throughout the world. Nothing much to report here. Returning then to the main space and heading up the staircase, we'll arrive at the bedroom I spoke of earlier, which has little physical separation with the other spaces in this room because it's really unnecessary. This is a bachelor pad and so there really don't need to be any acoustic or visual separations created between these spaces. The bathroom is also then situated smartly just next to the bedroom, allowing for late night trips when needed. And so I think this space is really well arranged and has a great view out into the city. Speaking on the use of materials, they're suitably kitsch, maybe even neo-kitsch, which elevates the design to feel much higher end than the other two apartments that we've seen, and that makes a lot of sense because this apartment's pretty expensive. Overall, I think this apartment is actually really well arranged. It makes use of most of the space extremely well, and it feels comfortable to inhabit. Even though it's just a retrofit apartment that was never really designed in the first place to be an apartment. But clearly this is a video game and so the fact that they've designed it this way to give you that sense makes it even more successful. But now we arrive at the most expensive apartment that V can acquire in Night City, located at Corpo Plaza for 55,000 eddies. It sits just a short walk away and an eyesight of the famous Corpo Plaza, home to the headquarters of some of the world's most powerful mega corporations like Arasaka, Militech, and Biotechnica. You might recognize this location then from Edge Runners, where it was a backdrop to some major parts of the story. An interesting and rather dark detail to this location though is that the apartment is actually directly across from the former site of the original Arasaka building, which was bombed by Johnny Silverhand in 2023 according to the story. This suggests a rather morbid reason for why V might have chosen this particular spot. I strongly suspect then that the designers are trying to say that Silverhand himself has really influenced V's desire to move here out of some dark desire to look on to what he saw as his greatest triumph, his magnum opus performance, as it were, where he actually killed 15,000 people. Again, it's, it's pretty dark. But hey, that's the cyberpunk genre for you. Entering the rather unassuming lobby from the crowded city center street, we're greeted by a very harsh, visually brutal style that CDPR calls neo-militarism, which as the name suggests is really brutal, dark, and even subtly violent with its red undertones. The way they've crafted this style is an excellent example of how design can be a storytelling device. Neo-militarism is the preferred style of the corporate world, which dominates the halls of power in this dystopian future. CDPR makes use of blacks to visually convey the humorless, oppressive nature of the corporate power structure, whereas the red accents communicate a sense of underlying dread that violence is waiting for people in this world at any time if they cross somebody or look at them the wrong way. Even the chandelier above us seems like it's going to crush us the moment we walk in. This is certainly no accident by the designers. One interesting note here though is that despite the fact that this is an apartment building for people in the upper echelons of society who really control and pull the strings of this world, they even themselves can't escape the effects and intrusion of hypercapitalism as is made evident by these advertisements on the wall. It suggests that even those in the corporate world are slaves to their own system. Kind of dark and, again, very cyberpunk. If we take a trip up, we'll find ourselves in a pretty nice lobby just outside the apartment itself. And after we step in, we find ourselves in a surprisingly smaller space than expected. However, given the location being at the center 
of the corporate world, it parallels the real world where even small apartments in high-end areas can cost the same as full-size homes elsewhere. One thing that really jumped out to me on first viewing is that the apartment is designed as a cross between the kitsch and neo-militarism styles, perhaps suggesting V's ties to both worlds, where they started originally as a corpro and then eventually had to resort to being an edge runner due to the path of the story. Like the Glen apartment, there's a kitchenette and bar space flanked by a dining area, but here it's a bit more formal than at the Glen and that's probably because it's a bit closer to the corporal lifestyle. The designers also here once again employed a subtle change to the floor and ceiling height and materials to divide the spaces, most notably here in the lounge area. I call your attention here to the deliberate use of red once again here to tie it to the neo-militarism style. There's clearly a lot more intention with this design than it first meets the eye. Opposite to the lounge and the dining area, we find a separating bamboo screen, which gives a bit more privacy to the bed area, and employs things like plants and wood, which again is a sign of wealth in this dystopian future where these things are very, very expensive. However, despite all this opulence, we still find above the bed yet another reminder of the intrusion of hypercapitalism in the cyberpunk world with this advertisement that just floats above your head while you try to sleep. Kind of disturbing, actually, but I guess if you live in this world, it's kind of normal to you at this point. Across from the bed is an exposed wardrobe, which flanks a well-equipped and finished bathroom. It's evident to me here, then, that there was a good understanding of the relationships between different programs, like making sure the area that you change is close to the shower and that both are close to the master bedroom. It means that the designers here were pretty conscious about just good design in general for floor plans and architecture. Right across from the foot of the bed, though, we'll find ourselves in this apartment's gun room. This one is a slight bit larger than the loft one and with the others that we found, and it definitely brings a much heavier influence in from neo-militarism with its red lighting and complex pattern styles. Overall then, this apartment is comfortable but feels maybe a bit impersonal and unresolved. The first is likely an intentional result of the corporate style, it's supposed to feel impersonal, but the second is, I think, more from a large unused space in the center of the room. This again makes it feel unresolved and maybe unfinished. It might have been better employed elsewhere where you could have made the bedroom maybe a bit larger or the lounge area a bit bigger. To know for sure though would require further investigation and floor plan, and to give CDPR credit here, optimizing the use of space to feel right is a skill that even seasoned architects and designers struggle with. and. It's something that can really only be solved through repeated iterations and exploration. Overall then, I think Cyberpunk's environment team did an incredible job on these apartments for V. They're not just spaces to store your things, but living and breathing parts of this world that have a connection with the story of V and the larger story of Cyberpunk. Each has a connection with a particular aspect of Night City as well, meaning that each one can be attractive to a certain kind of person. So if I had to choose which one was more suitable for me and which I like the most, it's probably going to be Japantown. Maybe because I live in Asia? <laughs> I don't know, but I like the location, I love the view, and I think the size is really cozy. If someone could just kill the gonk then fighting in the other apartment, it would be perfect. God, those guys annoy me. But what do you guys think? Which apartment do you think best suits you and why? Which one fits your personal story in Night City? Let me know down in the comment section below. And as always, if you guys love this video and you want to show some support, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. And don't forget that if you want to support the channel and you're also looking for a VPN service, you can check out NordVPN at nordvpn.com slash morphologist where you can get that two-year plan with four extra months free. Stay safe out there, Tombs. I'll see you in the next one.